I'm Joy Kerr, English language arts teacher at Thomas Middle School. I'd like to share with you why our class will have only written feedback in the gradebook this school year. I need to give accolades to a few leaders in education who have, through their research, writing, and presentations, encouraged educators around the world to make school better. Rick Wormelli, in a presentation in 2014, helped me realize I was on the right path, then gave me the courage to step it up a notch in order to affect more students. Ken O'Connor's research has led me to many other educators, and he's provided specific grading fixes. Dylan Williams' research and implementation of feedback has motivated me to keep up the fight, even when it seems impossible. And Mark Barnes has provided the tools needed to help make these ideas work in my own classroom. I'd also like to give a nod to my administration for their continued support. In our ELA class, students will focus on feedback on their reading, writing, grammar, and speaking. They will use this feedback and their revisions to provide evidence at the end of each quarter and generate a justifiable summative grade. In this video, I will explain general ideas regarding grades, examples of what's wrong with current grading systems, how I will attempt to fix some grading issues, and the importance of feedback in our ELA classroom. Thomas Guzki, editor of Communicating Student Learning, suggests that grading practices are not the result of careful thought or sound evidence. Rather, they are used because teachers experience these practices as students and, having little training or experience with other options, continue their use. Simply put, grades have become efficient ways of summarizing. According to Gusky, the number one purpose for grading is to communicate the achievement status of students to students, parents, and others. So, what's wrong with grades? Grading is complicated. Grading is subjective and can even be emotional. There is not much research on grading practices. There is no single best grading practice. And to top it all off, grading is not essential for learning. Timely and quality feedback is. Grades often reflect a combination of many factors, including achievement of many skills and behaviors. Teachers have a tendency to include several elements into a single mark. This blurs its meaning. This is the principal limitation of any grading system that requires a teacher to assign one number or letter to represent learning. One symbol cannot do justice to the different degrees of learning a student acquires. In many instances, students who do not comply with teachers' deadlines or parameters for neatness get marked down, and the grade no longer reflects what the student knows about the subject. Pop quizzes ambush students, adding stress to their lives and may even encourage them to cheat. Students who know the material are often penalized for not doing assigned practice work that they, frankly, may not need to spend time doing. Grading practice exercises, such as homework, makes learning look like a one-shot deal. When it is not, learning is a process. Students need lots of teaching, practice, and feedback before a skill is evaluated. Students need encouragement and supportive guidance, not more marks, while they try new and more demanding work. Criteria for grading in schools, grade levels, and subjects change frequently from teacher to teacher. This lack of consensus makes it difficult for students to understand the rules and for parents to understand what a summative grade actually means. I would argue that when a parent wants to know his child's grade, he really wants to know what his child is learning and how his child is progressing in the class. A grade alone gives no clear feedback on what students know or where they are in their learning journey. I'm trying to get rid of familiar letter grades. Grant Wiggins asserts that parents have reason to be suspicious of educators who want to tinker with a 120-year-old system that they think they understand, even if we know that traditional grades are often of questionable worth. So, let's address some logical fixes for grading. Reports or student progress and achievement should contain information that indicates academic progress and achievement separate from punctuality attitude, effort, attendance, and work habits. I will be giving feedback on standards and tracking behaviors and addressing them if needed separately. Since our district started digging into the Common Core standards, I have had a major shift in thinking. Under this system, when I design an assessment, I think in terms of the standards it is intended to address. If a writing assignment is given that covers three standards, then I make three entries in the gradebook for each student, one entry for each standard as opposed to one overall entry for the entire piece of writing. The difference in my gradebook is that students and parents will see written or even recorded feedback instead of marks. 
Of course, we will have multiple opportunities to learn various skills. Students who fail to meet standards will have the opportunity to revise and get more feedback on their work. More reading, writing, and speaking will help make my students better readers, writers, and orators. Students will be heavily involved in the grading process. In order to incorporate these ideas, we will need to emphasize the value of feedback in our class. There is well-researched evidence that marks on student work do not help in the same way that specific comments do. Dylan Williams explains by showing, through his research, what feedback works best. Students were given marks, both marks and comments, and comments only. Those who showed growth were the students who received only comments. Even if students received comments with their marks, they did not revise or improve their work. Students generally look only at grades and take little notice of comments unless there is no grade attached. What issues might we encounter when we implement feedback only throughout the year? Dylan Willem and Paul Black in Inside the Box explain, Much of the work needed can give rise to difficulties. Some pupils will resist attempts to change accustomed routines, for any such change is threatening. An emphasis on the challenge to think for yourself and not just work harder can be disturbing to many. Pupils cannot be expected to believe in the value of changes for their learning before they have experienced the benefits of change. Many of the initiatives that are needed take more class time, particularly when a central purpose is to change the outlook on learning and the working methods of pupils. Thus, teachers have to take risks in the belief that such investment of time will yield rewards in the future, whilst delivery and coverage with poor understanding are pointless and even harmful. They also assert, pupils are generally honest and reliable in assessing both themselves and one another, and can be too hard on themselves as often as they are too kind. However, pupils can only assess themselves when they have a sufficiently clear picture of the targets that their learning is meant to attain. Surprisingly, and sadly, many pupils have become accustomed to receiving classroom teaching as an arbitrary sequence of exercises with no overarching rationale. It requires hard and sustained work to overcome this pattern of passive reception on the teacher and the student's parts. When pupils do acquire such overview, they then become more committed and more effective as learners. Their own assessments become an object of discussion with their teachers and with one another, and this promotes even further that reflection on one's own ideas that is essential to good learning. The students and I will spend time learning how and then providing feedback about the particular qualities of each student's work, along with advice on what he or she can do to improve. In order to achieve this, we will nurture a classroom culture of questioning and deep thinking in which students will learn from shared discussions with one another. At the end of each quarter, each student and I will look at the evidence and ask, what information provides the most accurate depiction of this student's learning at this time? We will look for consistency in the evidence we've gathered. We must decide what evidence or combination of evidence represents the truest and most appropriate summary of the student's achievement in reading, writing, grammar, and speaking skills. We will use this evidence to come up with one letter grade to put on the progress report. At this point, my hope is that students and parents realize that being able to recognize and reflect on strengths and struggles is more important than one symbol that could not do justice to the different degrees of learning a student acquires. For more information or specifics on our processes in ELA class, contact me directly, check out our website, and feel free to explore these resources.